Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Craig, and I'd like to introduce myself and Kurt Hoppala from Malem Architects. Kurt is the, the big show. Uh, I'm the warm-up band, if you will, but I do want to share just a little bit of information about the program submission process for Northwest Akuho 2023 as we kick this off, and then Kurt will get into his presentation around uh, having a high-quality presentation that's thoughtful and engaging. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and just share. The submission timeline for uh, Alberta in 2023, the program submission form is open now. Uh, the deadline is uh, November 30th, and that's a Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. So the, the form will just kind of shut off then. We hope to get a uh, notification back to folks who submit on a, a program proposal by late December. And then the conference is February 13th through 15th, and that's 2023, uh, not 2022. So I'll correct that before we post the first Friday information. Types of programs. We have four different types of programs. The first one that you can choose from, and honestly, we're open to other ideas as well. Just pick the one that's gonna best uh, match what you're planning to do and then maybe send me a note and say Dave I, I chose case study presentation but this is what I'm really thinking um, we certainly want to hear your ideas this is a very uh, fluid uh, programming process at Northwest Decupo very welcoming and inclusive so if you've got an idea for another way to go about things uh, please let me know the one thing we've talked about as, as a board is that we want to stay away from like virtual presenters or, or virtual audiences. This is our first in-person uh, conference in a couple of years, and I think people are going to be expecting that experience. And so uh, we don't want folks filing into a room to sit in front of a big screen and be one of the Zoom boxes to a, a group of presenters uh, or vice versa. The collaborative information share is kind of your typical a conference program where you've got something you've done or that you're kind of a little bit of an expert on and you want to share that information out with everybody else. The case study uh, presentation is a little bit different um, and that's something where it could easily lend itself into um, either a, a full 50 minute presentation where the presenters are the primary focus or uh, and you know it's kind of a what so what now what then what type presentation and then with some takeaways that generally uh, we're going to be looking for things that are transferable to other campuses or other types of institutions. Uh, panel discussion uh, and that's something that if you're not sure you have enough content uh, for your piece of it or it's a really complex topic from a variety of functional areas or there's an uh, industry partner involved that type of thing. Think about a panel discussion. Uh, that's where each panelist maybe kind of sets things up with eight to 10 minutes of key points related to the topic from their perspective. Honestly, hopefully with a, enough preparation so that they certainly look like they prepared. You know, we don't want people to just walk in and start riffing in front of a crowd, uh, but maybe not so much as a typical um, content expert type 50 minute presentation. So all of that would kind of combine if you have three or four people on a panel to 25 or 30 minutes of content from the panel, and then 20 to 25 minutes of Q&A or discussion. Again, sometimes it's good to have um, some kind of back pocket, um, either discussion items or tasks for the group to do to kind of get them to mix and mingle because we're a very um, big geographically uh, organization, but we're also a very small organization in that people have a tendency to know folks at other institutions, um, because honestly, institutions aren't that big. You come to a conference, you're going to be talking to one or two other people if you're just talking to the folks from your school, um, and you probably want to get out and, you know, mingle a little bit. So that just kind of naturally happens. And then the roundtable or an interactive learning activity, and that's something where, you know, the presenters are more of a facilitator. Um, and have a little bit of content expertise and kind of tee things up, but then maybe have groups of folks work on different um, topic areas. So that could be a case study, not necessarily in the, hey, we did this and this is what happened type of case study, that a case study presentation would be. That'd be more like, you know, here's this new idea we have. How would you implement it in these different types of settings? 
um, and actually kind of build the case study there. So those are some different program types that we've got. Um, some key information we've asked, we've added a couple of new questions to the program submission form. And if you haven't presented before, or if you're someone who has uh, folks who haven't presented before that you work with, and they might be a little tentative around submitting something, we've asked a couple of questions at the end of the form on a request. One of them is a request to uh, ask for some mentoring or coaching on presenting. And that can be everything from helping you uh, brainstorming a topic, um, figuring out what would be a good area of strength for you to talk to a large group of folks about, uh, or even just someone to practice your presentation with. You know, I know that's something Kurt's willing to do, probably Jeremy's willing to do as well. Um, Jeremy's one of our uh, corporate partners at Malem along with Kurt. I myself am willing to do. Um, so you don't, doesn't need to be somebody at your institution. Certainly there are people at institutions that are willing to do that as well. And then also we put in an option uh, for folks to ask for help finding a co-presenter from another school or an industry partner. So certainly you could just, you know, click that. And when we see that type of a program submission come in, I'm going to circle back both, uh, circle back to those folks and say, hey, OK, so what are you thinking? And we'll get into a dialogue and uh, we'll try to match you up with somebody else that might have some uh, also interest in presenting on that topic, whether that's from another institution or uh, from an industry partner. On the program submission form, there's a couple of questions to not get hung up on. Again, we want to be uh, very fluid, innovative, and welcoming and inclusive in our program uh, proposal process. And so we do ask about experience presenting. In the body of the question, it says it's totally OK if you don't have any. And truly, it is totally OK if you don't have any. Um, we recognize that there's a lot of folks at, in Northwest Akuho and in the positions that engage in our regional association where uh, they don't have as much per, uh, experience, uh, professional experience, and then consequently presentation experience. And so, you know, don't have, let folks get hung up on that. Don't get hung up on that yourself. And um, in that same vein, years in the field. Again, it's totally okay if you have very few. We're just curious um, to kind of know who our presenter group is. Uh, down at the bottom, that's the, the web page for the part of the conference website that talks about program submission. So the northwestacujo.org slash page slash program submission. Uh, and again, we'll make these slides available to folks. And that's the end of my presentation. Here's my contact information. Uh, oops, uh, no, today was typo day for Dave. It's preselect at northwestacujo.org. Uh, so my apologies. I will fix that before we post this. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's tough. There's a, for whatever reason, in this cycle of the executive board, there's a, four of us here at OSU, and it's also our corporate mailing address as, a, as an association. So, um, but I will change that. And maybe it was just a little bit of a slip subconsciously on my part. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop share, and I will turn it over to Kurt and let him get his presentation set up and start sharing the screen. Thank you, Dave. Um, great to see everyone this morning. Uh, I am honored to be here to share a little bit of uh, uh, preparing and having a memorable uh, presentation. And, and I think it's important to to really hear the words that Dave Dave said that that just because you haven't been in the industry for a long time or that you ha aren't a skilled presenter doesn't mean you shouldn't uh, you, you shouldn't give it a go or try this on because it's actually part of uh, your professional development and I'm, I'm giving away a few of my uh, my key points. So maybe I'll just go ahead and uh, get started. And let's see, make sure I'm advancing. I also wanted to take a moment uh, to acknowledge that where I sit in Portland, Oregon uh, rests on the traditional village uh, sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Owlets, the Clackmet, Clackmas, Bands of the Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River, creating communities and summer encampments to harvest <clears throat> and use the plentiful natural resources of the area. I'm sharing this for two reasons. One is uh, from our standpoint and our vision, we want to ignore, uh, from a st statement of equity, we want to acknowledge the indigenous communities um, who uh, were caretakers of this land. And secondarily, for you as presenters to think about uh, your own 
uh, indigenous communities that you uh, benefit from and to think about that in your presentations. So I have a very short agenda. There are four main points, uh, why we're even having this conversation, and then some helpful hints to prepare, some things that I uh, stress uh, areas to avoid, and then some resources. And I'm um, hopefully creating enough time for some Q&A at the end, questions and answers. So introduction, who am I? Well, my name is Kurt Hoppala. I am a partner with Malum Architects. I've been with Malum for, I think, 27 years now. It's hard to believe. Um, I've really dedicated my career to uh, student housing and student-centric design. And, and throughout that journey, I have been presenting, certainly interviewing for work, but presenting uh, many, many years with Northwest Co and many other organizations as we go. Um, recently, I was able to catalog my my CV and and here it sits. So I've been doing this for a while. And and if nothing else, maybe I do have a few tips I can share with you. So why is this important? Why is presenting uh, uh, and thinking about a memorable presentation important? Well, first first of all, um, communicating effectively with your teams. Right. If if you are uh, interacting in your organization both uh, internally and externally with different departments or different universities, communication skills are so important. And it's something to, th something to think about. Communicating effectively with your students, with parents, with your communities, uh, and, and any stakeholders that may be involved in uh, your your day-to-day -day, uh, professional lives. Again, very important uh, skill building. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, Great presentation skills will help motivate your staff, motivate projects and project teams, and get people excited about what you might be excited about. Um, it's giving you skills to be confident to present at conferences like Northwest Akuho or other conferences that you interact and engage with. And then last but, well, not last but not least, um, in, in delivering confidently, you're, you're sharing your expertise, but you're your other people around you are recognizing that you do have expertise to share and that you are a, a, a someone that you want to engage with. And then last but not least, personal and professional growth. If you're at the beginning of your career, this is the time to begin honing these skills and then flexing those, those muscles throughout your career. So let's uh, talk about some helpful hints to begin preparing for, um, for a presentation. I think uh, I've got four subjects or four key points, understanding the why, your why, understanding your content, organizing your thoughts, and considering your audience. So what is your why? There is an idea that you may have gurgling uh, that you want to uh, write an abstract about. I think it's important to not just say, hey, I want to do this, but why is it important to you? Why is the is the is the content important to your industry, to you personally, to your organization. Um, and then also, you know, and, and try and write that down, jot your notes down, and then think about what the audience would benefit. You know, is there a connection to other universities that are dealing with similar issues? Are there other professionals that are dealing with similar struggles? Or you had a, you, you had some event in your professional career, this, this, uh, uh, an event or an experience that you want to share because you really feel like you learned a lot from it. And then another thing is uh, making sure that you actually really are passionate about the subject matter. It's one thing to maybe have done some research on something that you're not connected with. You're going to deliver a much more successful presentation if you truly um, show your passion for the subject matter. So understanding your content um, as I noted earlier, do you have this personal experience? Have you had um, uh, events or, or experiences in your professional career that have really shaped uh, the way you do your work that you feel you want to get that message out because it could help someone else that might be going through something similar? Um, telling stories. It's not just sharing a research assignment, but telling stories is much more com compelling. People get captivated and swept up in stories that have a learning message um, as opposed to just uh, reciting a research uh, outcomes. Uh, but on that note, 
having some research will add credibility and frankly fill out the message that you want to deliver because you have taken the time to do that research. And again, the applied knowledge. If you've done some research, you've tried to apply it in the work, and there's some interesting outcomes, um, just adds to our richness of, of uh, understanding your, your content. And then organizing your thoughts is really important for the presentation. And I would actually suggest that organizing your thoughts for the abstract submission is the start of that process. You know, uh, I often start with an outline. When I'm submitting to Northwest Kuo or anything else, I have this idea, I start with an outline and flesh it out and see where the gaps are. That then would inform the 200 or 500 word abstract. And frankly, the title comes last for me. And the title does have to be catchy uh, because that one line is gonna draw you in or it's gonna put you to sleep as you're, you're scrolling on your phone with all the sessions you wanna attend. So anyway, so organizing your thoughts, as I noted, outlining your talking points, uh, right? There's a difference between the written uh, abstract and the talking points you want to make. And so figuring out some kind of flow, uh, just like any good uh, uh, essay or, or um, written content, you need an introduction, you need your main content, and you need to conclude. Missing those will uh, potentially lose your audience. Um, at Malem and, and in our industry, we talk about a KOM, uh, which is an acronym or a, an abbreviation for key overriding message. What is the big message you're trying to deliver? And making sure it's woven in the storyline throughout the session. And then as I noted, case stories, uh, case studies and stories, visual aids, anecdotes, add kind of add to the color and the richness of the content that you want to deliver. So considering your audience, I think, is actually important. Uh, now, we know that Northwest Sakuho, you're likely going to pre be presenting to many of your peers. But those peers may be um, early in their career or could be senior housing uh, officers. But there are architects that could be in the room, like Jeremy or myself, or vendors, furniture vendors or systems vendors. And so it's important to acknowledge that um, the audience is going to be more diverse than you think, uh, and that they don't know what you know, which is a little bit of a confidence builder. Uh, you don't have to be Steve Jobs and stand up and say something amazing and everyone kind of falls out of their chair, but you have knowledge to share, and that's why you're standing up in front of them. Um, we have learned over the years, too, that we need to think about equity and inclusion and that someone in the audience is going to need an accommodation. Uh, and so be thoughtful about graphics. Even this slide that you see has high contrast and big fonts, and um, which is hard for architects because we want to put in lots of graphics and sometimes it's hard to access. And so be thoughtful about equity and inclusion. Um, is the audience a mix of professionals? Well, I just described Northwest Akuho, there is a mix of professionals and they don't all um, live in the world that you live in day to day. And then um, audience participation, get your audience involved is, a, is an easy way to have a successful experience because if they're interrupting and asking questions and um, it, it's a round table or something, you're, you're just gonna have a great, great success. So pro tips, what is the why? Um, one way I think about that is uh, again, sounding passionate and enthusiastic will just draw your audience in. They'll be like, I don't know what Kurt's talking about, but he seems really interested in it. So I'm interested. Um, understanding your content. Again, if you have command of what you're saying, you're, you're gonna sound confident. And, and when we interview for work, sometimes if we're uh, presenting concepts that are complex and, and we don't understand it, you, you don't seem as confident in that content. Uh, don't bury the lead in terms of organizing your thoughts. This is from, uh, I think, uh, uh, the news industry, right? Uh, you need to get your lead out there right away. What's the point you want to make? Say it up front. Don't say it on slide 15 because the audience will be like, wait a minute, that, what are we talking about here? You, it, it, it's just, you got to make that point first. Uh, and then considering your audience, uh, I'll, I'll pick on my industry as architects, um, we tend to use lots of ARCA speak and jargon, but if you keep your language simple, 
and use and use plain like yeah, don't use seven dollar words when a two dollar word don't use 12 words when a one word will work um it's just going to allow that audience to stay with you you don't have to sound smart you are smart uh so when we're practicing for the interview uh, here are some hints i wanted to, to deliver and these are seem really simple but when you are up there and you're feeling anxious or stressed, you, you forget about some of this fairly basic stuff. Uh, 20 some years ago, when I first took some interview training, and I mentioned this to, to Dave and Tiffany before all y'all got on, um, one thing that stuck with me is that uh, communication is 92% is nonverbal. So there's so much that goes into presenting and, and I'm even using little hand gestures and inflection and, and my body language that you can see. <laughs> These are all clues uh, about communication and there's research about this and it's all very interesting. So helpful hints, um, making eye contact, hard to do on Zoom. I don't know who's looking at me, but when you're in a room presenting, um, making eye contact is gonna be really important to connect with the audience. Now. Don't fixate on one person and stare at them because that'll just make them uncomfortable. <laughs> but um, so varying your eye uh, contact with people around the room, you don't have to like make on eye contact with everybody. But if you think about different points in the room, it's going to help you make connections. It's going to help you feel confidence. Um, if you really, really just eye contact is a thing for you, and I'm not, and I'm not dismissing that, you can pick points in the room past people. And you can still give people a sense that you are connecting with people. And it's a little bit of a shortcut <laughs> if that's an issue. Um, a note about looking up and looking down. Uh, that also tends to distract the audience. If you're up, look, you're think, you're, if you're thinking for your thoughts and you're doing this or you're, you're kind of down, you're sending a really uh, a confusing signal to the audience. And you, you, you just don't help bring them along. And so, um, you can, of course, look away. You can take a moment and think about what you're thinking of, but just don't make habits of that because, again, you just lose the audience. Okay, body language, posture, hard for me to communicate um, on this screen, but you're going to be in a room with 25, 30 people, right? So standing with confidence is actually very important. Uh, having a power stance, not like superhero, but um, standing with confidence with you know, good body posture without slouching is in, is actually important and um, something to keep in the back of your mind. I tend to move, but not, uh, but move with purpose, right? Uh, moving around the room, moving towards a lectern, moving towards an individual. These are good, good things because you're, again, what, what, what is he doing? Where, where is Kurt going? Right. Um, but don't make it to, to, um, too fast or too uh, agitated because that's that's the wrong thing. <laughs> um, adapting a comfortable posture, but again, not too comfortable. Don't start getting lazy and slouch. I often will lean against a lectern uh, because it's there and it gives me another another place to go if I'm tired of just standing with a, 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 a you know in that in that power stance. So having one or two. Uh, places to to have a posture that's still professional uh, and engaging. And sometimes people need to hold a clicker or hold, hold a pen or hold a notebook, or I'm going to talk a little bit about um, note cards. That's a good tool as well to maybe give you some grounding for um, just having good body language. Pace, volume, tone, and inflection. These are important to keep in mind, and it's hard in the moment to keep this in mind, but one of the things that I run into, and I hope I don't run into today, is matching your content with the time. So, you know, if if you looked at the early slides that Dave provided, the 50 minute session, you actually need to think about the 50 minutes and budget time within your presentation for that, because there's nothing worse than running long, because you don't get to run long. Everyone will just leave, and then you've lost no time for Q and A, uh, or you've provided no time for Q and A, and and then you didn't even complete your thought. Maybe you had a big finish and you didn't get to it, right? So you got to really think about time management. Um, projecting your voice is also important. If you're someone that is soft-spoken or shy, that's okay. Um, a microphone might be uh, at your disposal at the lectern or having a microphone or just 
if it sound if it feels like you're talking loud, that might be fine, but the, the person in the back of the room can hear you, and and that's something to to be thinking about. Moderating your tone, uh, you probably already sense that I've been kind of going up when I get excited and then talking more more in a monotone as I'm moving through content. Those changes are important because again, the it cues the viewer or the audience into something important is happening because Kurt's getting more excited. Um, thinking about pauses and changes in voice for emphasis. If I have a story to tell that about a student that was struggling or you might have a story, you know, just listen to the way I've slowed down a little bit and um, changed my tone. Those are cues that the audience really feeds into because this is important. This is really important that he's now delivering his content. And then physical emotion, which is somewhat hand in hand with some of those tones, expansive gestures. You've been seeing me move my hands, um, but do it with reasonable speed. Because if you're doing this, that's just agitating. That's not good. But if you're if you're if you're using gestures to to emphasize something, that's that's actually very important. It goes back to that that communication, uh, nonverbal communication, smiling. You saw earlier when Dave was talking, I moved my eyebrows up and down about something. I can't remember, but little things like that just open open the audience up that I'm a real human being. I might be fun to hang out with. Maybe not. I don't know. But like, I'm, I'm a real person. I'm not just uh, providing a, a lecture as a faculty member. And, and maybe that's not fair to faculty members. Um, physical simulation. And what I mean by that is like, the, the it's almost like miming. I don't know if you would ever do a, a fake basketball shot or a bowling, but I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Sometimes that's actually important to simulate something in the room for effective communication. And this last one, it's okay to show emotion. Probably a few of you in this room have seen me get a little teary eyed or even emotional about if I'm talking about something around equity, or I remember bringing my a photo of my daughter into a session about sustainability and i i got emotional about it it's okay don't fall apart that's just uncomfortable but uh, emotions powerful tool so some pro tips in this arena making eye contact again stop the audience will be engaged um, if, if they see that you're listening on the body language um no fig leaves and what i mean by that is oftentimes and i think i can try and do this oftentimes people will go like this that's that's the fig leaf. It's very it's weird. It's a neutral position and it's uh, it's it's it it doesn't look good. So that could be a natural uh, posture for you, um, but um, don't do that. <laughs> um, sometimes with pace and volume and tone, you get ahead of yourself. You start speaking fast. Take a moment <clears throat> to not try and speed through your content. And you know, worst case scenarios, don't finish. But don't try and jam it all in because that's almost worse. But uh, so physical motion, be physically engaging. And frankly, this is a little bit about stage presence. And if some of you ever were in your high school musicals or acting or had any kind of, this is actually important. You're, you are performing a little bit. So kind of embrace that a little, a little bit. And, and, and you'll, those dramatic movements could add to the to the presentation. All right, so let's talk about some things to avoid. How are we doing on time? We're doing okay. I just literally went and checked on my clock. I think that's okay. I think it's okay to acknowledge that you're timing and that I've got to move a little faster or I've got to slow down or whatever. Helpful hints to avoid. Um, it's like Kurt's top 10 things with what not to do, but there's only five here. Um kind of, sort of, or like uh, jargon acronyms and initialisms, uh, reading your notes, staring at the screen and swaying. So I just wanted to go through a few of these. It is natural for all of us to say, um, in between things, or it's kind of like this, or sort of like that, or like I was talking the other day and like somebody said this and like, like, like those things are actually very distracting. Um, and I just did it. I just said, um, I think that all things in moderation is another way to look at it. It's okay to use ums sort of and kind of, but when you use them as your placeholder, as you're shifting from thought to thought, 
it almost becomes a barrage of them and can be very distracting. Oh, I'm sorry, I had notes for you. Can be distracting, convey a lack of confidence too. If you're um like I was um thinking um about this thing, now I'm the audience going what? what? Um, there he did it again. Too much use. Uh, you could risk losing your audience, right? Now they're going to start scrolling through their Facebook and checking their emails because you're not engaging them. And frankly, it doesn't sound all that professional if you're um and like this and like that. So it's hard because we all do it. Avoid using jargon, acronyms, and initialisms. Why? Well, I, I actually had to look up what uh, what initialisms were, and that is um, using shorthand and we all do it in our industries architects are bad at it but think about the um uh, the the acronyms or the jargon that you use in the housing industry and then think about what you use at your own campus because there are departments and processes that probably have an acronym at Oregon State or at UW or something people don't know what they are and so uh, avoiding use that industry terminology will help again allow your audience to stay with you. Uh, and it avoids saddling them with the chore of deciphering what you just said. We often refer to schematic design as SD and design development as DD. And before you know it, we're rambling on about something and we've forgotten the fact that the audience, what, what did you just say? And it's, it's, it asks a lot of the audience to say, I don't know what you just said. They're not gonna do it, right? They're here to receive that content. You might even miss your main point if your main point had some jargon in it or something. And then the, the alienation of audience members, right? If they aren't feeling included, they're turning off and you're, you, you've lost them. So, so be thinking about that and, and it will move on. Don't read your notes. Yeah, that's not a good thing. There is a difference between the spoken word and the written word. And you're going to type out your conference abstract and it's going to be complete sentences, hopefully. And and well thought out, but you don't talk the way you write. No one does. And so you do need to make this translation. And so if you are reading your notes, you will likely be with your head down and you'll be reading sentences that don't sound like the way you would talk. Uh, so again, it's all about connecting with the audience. And it, it, you know, another way to look at it is, uh, you know, it may reveal that you're not prepared. And uh, I, I do recommend being prepared um, for those things. Just said um again. Don't stare at the screen. That's not an issue in this virtual world because I'm staring at my screen, but you don't know that. I could be reading notes and you might not know it, except written spoken word is differently. But where you're in person and you've got a big screen behind you, you've got content up there and you might be nervous. There is a tendency to look up at the screen and see your bullet points and go, oh yeah, that's what I wanted to say. But then there's a, a habit, if you're constantly looking up there, you don't ever turn back to the audience. And this is another killer, small thing, but it again, the audience is gonna be like, well, they're not even talking to me. And those slides are not for you, they're for the audience, which goes back to note cards. It's okay to have note cards to help remind you of your main bullet points just as long as you're not reading them okay power stance right uh you don't have to stay frozen like a superhero but if you find yourself fidgeting and swaying because like that's a, a coping mechanism for your nerve your anxiety that's also kind of makes the audience uncomfortable so just you know avoid those things because if you look uncomfortable and you're slouching and you're quiet like you're not a really compelling presenter. You're gonna lose your audience. All right, so some of my pro tips on the, on the don't, um, the power of the pause, right? You are gonna be switching from point to point, from slide to slide. And instead of saying, um, just be quiet for a moment, collect your thoughts, but do it, do it inside. It silences power sometimes. What I often do, if there's a an acronym that's important, I'll I'll say it, and then that, and so that means blankety blankety blank. And there's a little bit of education, but some inclusion there. So you're you're saying, hey, you know, comfort service animal CSAs, 
we, we use CSA as part of our jargon. So now you've just included them in part of that industry language, which isn't a bad thing. But if you're constantly doing that, that you know, burn up a lot of time in your presentation explaining acronyms. Again, reading, reading notes bad, referring to them okay, because it's also something that you can have in your hand. And it does show that this individual took the time to get prepared. And making individual eye contact, and I wish I could, means that if I'm looking at Atlas and I have some facial expression, I've included that person in this journey that we're having together. And they feel individually important because I actually made eye contact and maybe smiled at them. So my final thoughts, and we've got plenty of time for Q&A, that's good, um, is again, thinking about uh, you're on stage. It's some theater and maybe embrace that if you can, because it is much more compelling to have someone up there that's dynamic and interesting and goofy, try something new, shows vulnerability versus someone that's up there behind the lectern because that's a safe space and clicking through their notes. Um, it's just, have some fun with this. Your personality is gonna be different than my personality, right? But bring your personality to the, to the stage. Stop and tell a story. This reminds me of something I, as a kid that I did. And why, why is that important? Um, I like making jokes. I think it, um, it disarms the audience, not, not because I feel like they're armed, but it just allows people to laugh and feel comfortable in the space. And that's why I chose all these little silly kid pictures. And if you'll notice that first picture of me was me as a little kid. <laughs> so it's silly, but silly can be can, can add to the richness of a presentation. Those personal insights, those stories, storytelling is so important. You have a point to make, but it was probably, it could be best shared in a story. Um, and then leave them wanting more. I don't really know if I have a great tip for that, but if you're doing a great job and you land the plane and you 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 know you land that big last point and you have great Q and A, people be like, "Wow, I want to, I want to, I want to see another presentation from Kurt again." And a lot of the times, I'm so crazy, I'll have two presentations at Northwest Cool. So then you can you can actually go see another presentation for Kurt because he's had. He's presenting on Tuesday as well as Monday or something like that. I don't know. Um, I do have some resources and I think uh, I didn't prepare for this, but I'm going to go ahead and copy these and paste them into the, uh, the chat. There are articles that are just a great read. There are a lot of the same points that I've made, you'll, you'll read again. But again, if you need to get confidence, say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write that abstract and reach out to Dave, Craig, reach out to me or Jeremy. I'd love to coach you. love to uh, listen to your presentation and say, uh, I like it, but I don't understand what you just said over here. We're here for resources. So with that, I'd like to open this up for questions. Thank you so much, Kurt, for the knowledge you've shared and the information. We have one question from Ali, who okay. uh, I believe you should be able to unmute and ask it if you would like. Hi, Kurt. Thanks so much for your presentation. Um, my question was in relation to your slide on the like power stances. Oh, so. Yeah. Uh, this can be really challenging for folks with mobility aids, such as canes, wheelchairs, walkers. I myself am a mobility aid user. So I was wondering if you had any recommendations to adapt some of those suggestions that you had. Yeah, well, um, thank you for the question. I, I think that's fantastic that you brought that up because earlier I talked about uh, providing accommodations. Um, and so in your situation, I think it's, well, this is my perspective and you can challenge me on this. I think it's comp completely appropriate before your session starts to ask questions about sight lines. If, if you are using a mobility device, um, think about the way the tables and chairs are laid out. Can everyone see you? Uh, and if the answer is no, ask for some help to move some tables and chairs, get the stuff out of the way. Um, I don't have a problem 
asking for help and I don't have a problem helping you um, because it's important to make that connection with you as a person. Uh, I doubt very much. Well, actually, Dave, that's a good question. Um, could there be stages or platforms that are brought in to elevate someone that's in a, in a, a mobility device? Is is that something that can be accommodated? I think it probably depends on the venue, uh, but it's certainly something that could be asked about. Uh, okay. So, I mean, for sure. Yeah. Another thing, which is maybe less directly applicable to your question, is the use of microphones, right? Uh, having the microphone and being able to use a microphone will help anyone in the back of the room, help someone that may have a hearing difference. And so there are all, we should make the assumption that accommodation is required. So, but anyway, getting back to your direct point, I would manipulate the room and be really transparent about it. I want to make sure that everyone can see me. Uh, now, if you're uncomfortable with that, we we can talk through that or we can talk offline, but I would, that's, that would be my position. I'd move the room around to suit my uh, presentation. Thank you. That's a really good uh, tip. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Anything else? And to speak to, to Kurt's mention of, um, you know, what is offered to pre presenters or moving the room around, I know Dave is going to be paying attention to all of the program submissions. And so if as a presenter, people are, um, you know, wanting a, a specific setup or there are certain uh, room styles or maybe prep time that would be beneficial, I think Dave and the Northwest School Board can work to ensure we're creating a successful conference experience for both our, our attendees, but also our presenters. So as much as we are able to, I think we want everyone to feel their best and feel confident in presenting. Um, and so uh, we will work kind of on an individual basis with each of our presenters or our attendees if there is more that we can be doing outside of just the, the standard setups and um, uh, tools. Can, can I dwell on the question a little bit more? Because it's making me think about other things that I do. Um, I probably budget the half an hour before my session to try and get in the space as soon as possible, which might mean I have to give up a session. Uh, and I often can't get into the room a half an hour earlier, but sometimes I can. But the point I'm making is you wanna get in there and get whatever room layout that you need set up or the technology set up. And let me tell you half the time, you think this is gonna be easy to plug and play. And I think Northwest Kuho does an outstanding job of making sure the rooms are ready for you, but it never works out tech never works out. And so being there early enough means that um, you can uh, call for help or, or get, get IT support in that room to make sure your, your computer docs correctly with the whatever, whatever. Um, so getting the tech set up or the room set up if you're doing a roundtable session or Jeremy and I have done some interactive uh, puzzle pieces. We've, I think in Edmonton, we shipped up a bunch of boards and because we had a really interactive workshop. And so that takes time to set up. And so um, getting in the room early is important. So there you go. So Jeremy has a question. What yeah, well, actually, just, I just wanted to make a comment, Kurt. I, I, want, I wanted to just say that the picture of you when you were younger um, was, and you'd mentioned that you know you bring humor into your presentations, and I think a lot of people appreciate that. Um, but I think what's really important about that that introduction is that it lets people. It's like an icebreaker. It lets people relax. Yeah. I think that's really important, not only for you as a speaker to have that confidence just by entering in the room, relax, but allowing the audience to relax too is so important because it, it brings it brings back the comfort level um, to the room. And I think that's just a really good tool to, to try and do that. And it's instant. You don't have to like, you don't have to make an exercise out of it. You just, it's just right. up there on the, on the slide. So. Cool. Thank you.
Don't be shy. <laughs> Ask away. Yeah. Another comment that um, was shared directly with me in the chat, just more around the differences in present presentation styles and um, sort of the, the visual, physical um, representation of, of how you're doing the presentations. And they just noted that uh, there's sort of a, a diversity of folks who are presenters and maybe reading from notes or moving around or um, the eye contact piece, like that can look different for a lot of um, different people as far as identity or even cultural differences. And so I think you've named that a little bit throughout this presentation, but um, the the individual just wanted to name that they're, that, that may show up very differently for other folks um, and not uh, just one presentation style can fit for, for all folks. Yeah, I, I think that's very appropriate commentary. Um, I'm certainly delivering um, my experiences uh, from my perspective. Uh, and as I, you know, and the firm grows and learns about um, making sure that our graphics and our communication is more universal, uh, that does lend itself to very different um, expectations in, in the room. And I, and I think, um, the best advice there is being transparent about anything that's going on. Because if you're if you're an audience member, you're still your expectation is still to feel connected to the presentation, learn about the content, and if there's any confusion in the room, transparency and uh, is going to help bridge those gaps, no matter what the the unique circumstances. Tiffany, do we have any other questions in the chat? Uh, none have come in uh, since that. All right. And just a quick double check, no questions from the group. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Kurt, for a very engaging presentation today. And folks, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, ideas around uh, the program for the upcoming annual conference, please shoot me a note at pres-elect or at northwestacuho.org or uh, dave.craig at oregonstate.edu. Thank you all for spending some time with us today. I know that we'll be posting this video of this presentation on our YouTube uh, channel, and so we'll make that available to folks who weren't able to be here or if there's something that you want to reference back. Uh, afterwards, certainly you'll be able to do that. So thank you all again. And with that, uh, oh, absolutely. And uh, if you're interested in presenting a First Friday webinar, uh, please let uh, myself or uh, Tess, our Canadian representative, or Matthew, who was in the meeting today, uh, know that you may uh, have a topic and you'd be interested in sharing that with the rest of the association. So and I forgot, I forgot to add into the chat, the resources that I said I would. So if you want to copy and paste those, those are the different articles that if you're interested in reading, you, you can. There might be some additional insights, um, but I, I, I do want to emphasize that you can do it. Uh, you got this. Um, give it a go. Give it a try. And, and we're here for you, too. If you really want to reach out to any of us, I would love to help support you. So, And I look forward to seeing you. I'll be in Calgary as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Try and enjoy some of the weekend. And uh, we'll see uh, some of you, I hope, in Calgary. Thank you. See you later. Thanks so much, everyone.